Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I Keshwani. I have been solving math problems for GMAT out of this book here, the GMAT Review, the official guide. If you do not own this book already, purchase it immediately. You will find it at mba.com. That's the best way to prepare for the GMAT. Don't waste your time and money uh, doing the problems out of fake problems out of uh, other books that are on the market. The books and the people who should remain nameless. This is the real McCoy. I figured since I know the expression, why not use it? Anyway, I'm about to solve a problem which you will find on page number 177, problem solving number 182. Let's see what it says. It says, the average arithmetic mean of x and y is 60. Well, I'm going to make a note here. Average of x and y is 60. And then I'm told that the average of y and z is 80. What is the question? The question is what is the value of z minus x? Alright, we're looking for z minus x. Well as you can see this is an algebra problem and because it's an algebra problem there are two ways of solving this problem. If you have watched my previous clips, uh, any of my previous clips, perhaps you've heard me say this thing in the other algebra problems. When you come across an algebra problem in the GMAT there are two ways of solving it. One is what I call the classical way, the orthodox way, the traditional way, the geeky way, the nerdy way, the proper way, the academic way, the way your math teacher would like you to solve it, the way these people who give you the exam expect you to solve it, which is the classical way. And then the other one is what I call the quick and dirty way where you just make up numbers for the variables, plug in numbers for the variables, substitute numbers, solve the problem, get the answer and then see which answer choices among the answer, which, which of the answer choices matches the answer that you came up with. That's what it is. So I'm going to first do it with the plugging in and then I'm going to show it the classical way only if you're interested in looking at it. I don't want you to do it the classical way in the real exam. Don't waste your time with it. Nobody's interested in it. Nobody's going to be impressed by it because nobody looks at your work. So don't waste your time. But just to satisfy your curiosity, I'm going to do the classical way in a second. Let's first do the plugging in way. So I have two numbers, x and y, and I know that uh, their average is 60. So I'm going to make up two numbers where average comes out to be 60. Since their average is 60, they have to add up to 120. So I'm just going to make up something. Let's pretend that x is 100 and the y is 20. Now the thing with the plugging in technique is that once you have plugged in the value for the variable in the problem where it appears first, it has to have the same value, that variable has to have the same variable, that variable has to have the same value throughout the problem. So if that variable appears on five different occasions, you cannot keep changing the value. That's the whole point. So here I've made y to be 20. That 20 has to come over here. That's the part you have to keep in mind. And I'm told that the value, uh, the average of x and y is 180. If the average of two numbers is 180, they have to add up to 160. That's the only way you're going to get the average of 180 because 160 divided by 2 is going to give you 80. And my y is already 20, which means z would have to be 140. You see? So how many know, how many variables did I plug in here for? There are three variables. How many how many variables did I plug in the value for? The answer is two. If there are three variables, you cannot plug in values for three, all three of the variables. For example, if I tell you that a plus b plus c equals 10, you can plug in anything you want for a and b. Anything at all. Anything. Fractions, decimals, fra negative numbers, positive numbers, anything you want. For example, if I tell you that a is 3 and b is 5, can I go ahead and plug in something else here for c? Of course not. Because there are three variables, which means I have a luxury of plugging in only two variables. 3 and 5, once I plug in, that's 8, c would have to be C would have to be 2. It has to do with degrees of freedom for those of you who know the terminology for, from statistics. But anyway, we won't go there. So once I plug in the value of x and y, z has to emerge from the problem itself. I cannot go around plugging any old thing, but that's it. We are done. The question simply is, what is z minus x? z is 140. x is 100. Therefore, z minus x is 40. That's your answer. Answer is 40. What letter is that? Answer is B. 
That's all. Now I'm going to do the same problem in a classical way. Just to amuse you, that's all. That's the only reason I'm doing it. Alright? So, if the, if the average of x and y is 60, what can we say about the sum of x and y? Well, what number divided by 2 is going to give me 60? 120. So, x plus y, x plus y would have to be 120. Then I'm told that the average of y and z is 80, which tells me that y plus z has to equal 160. Now, since they're looking for y, uh, z minus x, I'm going to put this equation at the bottom here so that I can do, I'm going to just subtract the two equations, that's all it is. So I'm going to rewrite this equation at the bottom here. I'm going to put y underneath y. So this x plus y, I'm writing it as y plus x. And this is 120, that's all it is. So that top equation is gone. And I'm just going to subtract the two equations. I'm going to subtract the bottom equation from this, from this equation here. So this is my equation number one, which is what this is, equation number one, and this is equation number two. This bottom part is the equation number one, just written in a different form. And then I subtract equation one from equation two. This is a plus, becomes minus. Let me change the color again. As you know probably by now, I have a flair for the dramatics. So here, y minus y, y drops out. And then this gives me z minus x, which is what they're looking for, z minus x, which gives me 160 minus 120, which is 40. That's it. Voila. That's all it is. All right? That's all it is. This, so now I'm going to erase this top part because I don't want you to get confused. I'm just rewriting the first equation in a different form, but I'm going to take it out so that you don't get confused between the... I'm not doing anything with the... This is it. This is what we're doing here. The first equation, the first equation is this one, x plus y equals 60. I'm just writing in a different form. And let's just subtract the first equation from the second equation, that's it. z minus x equals 40. So that's the classical way. That's the plugging in way, as I told you before. Just give me a second, let me look at the clock. Alright, so that was some 7 minutes into it. Listen, if you wish to purchase my DVDs, where I have put together solutions to all the math problems, there are about 400 of them out of this book here. There are 200 problem solving questions and 150 data sufficiency questions. You must practice all of them if you, if you want to get a decent score. If you, want to have a, if you want to have a hope of getting a decent score, the more you practice, the better you will get it, obviously. It's a matter of practice. That's what it is. It's a skill. Because they're not looking for how much math you know. They're just trying to see how well you take the exam. And how well you take the exam depends on how, how, how uh, acquainted you get to the exam. And how acquainted you get to the exam, of course, is directly proportional to how much time you put into it. The more you practice, the more acquainted, the more familiar you will get to it. Anyway, enough said. If you wish to purchase my DVDs, where I have put together solutions to all the problems, or if you wish to hire me for personal private tutoring, in either case, go to my website at www.prep, P-R-E-P, prep, for, F-O-R-4, gmat, dot com and send me an email. All right. Thank you.